Good morning, folks. My name is Dr. Aditya Nji, and we are here on the CSA platform for our 16th episode of Strategically Speaking with Dr. Aditya Nji. We have a distinguished guest today, Dr. Manan Devedi, and we will be carrying on a conversation with him on cinema and international relations. Just for sake of our viewer, viewers, today is Thursday, December 14th. It's 6 a.m. Eastern Day Time in United States, and it is around 4.30 p.m. in India. Dr. Devedi is an assistant professor of political science and international relations at Indian Institute of Public Administration. He is a very well-known figure. He has authored eight books on China, international relations, US foreign policy, etc. He appears periodically on various media platforms as a panelist as well as a critic. He also teaches uh, Indian Foreign Service, you know, and junior diplomats, and also advises the Ministry of External Affairs. He has come out with a very interesting book. The title of the book is Cinema and International Relations. It's not a very big book. It has 148 pages and eight chapters. It's been published this year by N Books Private Limited. But going through the book, it's a very dense book. There's a lot of information and it's a scholarly work. So we are going to be discussing the topic of this particular book, as well as the field of international relations and cinema. And I was very curious because, at least in Indian context, this topic is really not discussed academically. And going through the book, it appears that it's a very scholarly academic work you know, very dense work uh, summarized in 148 pages. So I welcome Dr. Manan Devedi, Assistant Professor at Indian Institute of Public Administration. Welcome to our platform, Dr. Devedi. Thank you, sir. My, my first query is that, what inspired to choose this topic? And what are you trying to tell the Indian academics and maybe the foreign policy establishment. Is there a central message of this book you are trying to give? Ah, sir, it's 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 such a nice occasion, an opportune occasion to be uh, to for myself to be be there at CSA and uh, and Atenji uh, Aditenji, sir. Now it's a very pertinent question that uh, why did I choose to uh, uh, write on this particular theme as far as international relations and its attendant portrayal by mainstream cinema, both in Bollywood and also in Hollywood is concerned. So I would just like to uh, remark over here, sir, that uh, mainstream cinema is something which was especially the Hollywood cinema was something which was getting very popular during our toddlerhood days, during our childhood days in the 80s and 90s, as far as uh, India is concerned. And we were being very much, we were getting enamored, attracted, and we started assiduously adhering to uh, the mainstream American narrative about power, wealth, military might, technological advancement, and themes like the do-gooder and the philanthropic urge of the American nation. But we came all the way to India too, wherein we watched uh, as small kids and younglings, uh, Hollywood uh, constructs such as uh, Border, uh, LOC, and several other movies uh, based upon China war. So that created an air of imagination in my heart as I was an avid reader, eclectic reader all across uh, my childhood and young days and, and toddlerhood days. My father used to be the inspiration. Added on to this, uh, this thing as a personal note, 
uh, he was a person who introduced us to the Hollywood. And Bollywood was always just a stone throws away uh, from our uh, home, from our home state. And we derived a kind of a conjointness uh, with India being not as a poodle in American lap, not being a secondary state, but America and India, United States of America and Bharat as two conjoined entities who were brought in together, whose interests were similar, who could converse together who could come together as a bilateral conglomerate because of the commonalities of something which might appear tried to some, but the commonalities of rule of law, constitutionalism, liberal democracy, respect for human rights, and the idea of Vasudev Kutumbukam taken up in the positive sense of frame. So these were the ideas which attracted us, both my father and myself, to the American cinema. We did not have the resources or the awareness to look for the alternate media of cinema in United States of America, which was progressing or must have been produced during the 80s and 90s. And later on, as it happened, I joined Jawaharlal Nehru University in the School of International Studies uh, in the American Studies Division, where we were further exposed to American narratives, American literature, and the this, this is something which I would like to, uh, to relate to uh, with a bit of hesitancy, but that is the point that coming in from a particular university and a couple of, and a particular grouping of collectivity or a collectivity, America was not, was sadly and unfortunately viewed very negatively by the, uh, by our peer group and by the people who were teaching us. But our teachers were very positivist also. They were very optimist who went on to contend that, yes, there happens to be a natural camaraderie or a natural uh, bonhomie and an understanding and a kind of a creative partnership which can be created between New Delhi and Washington. So, sir, I would like to cut, my, cut myself short here. This was the innate inspiration. Hollywood cinema, the American literature, which we read under the able guidance of our professors in American Studies Division, which brought in the instinctual urge in me to go ahead and do something on cinema. Though I had talked about uh, IR, American Foreign Policy in IR Theory, I have written books from Pentagon Press, which became pretty popular, of Serendipity and the American Dream, wherein I intentionally and intently eulogized the American Dream with the Indian connection, which could really serve the purposes of the world towards betterment, advancement, human security and peace. So that way the attraction for cinema, along with the reading of American political science literature, led me on to this journey of mine, sir. Thank you, Dr. Devedi. Uh, let's say in context of the nation I was born in and the nation you are residing in, apart from projecting the soft power of the nation, how cinema has contributed to enhancing the foreign policy agenda of Bharat. Very true. It's a very pertinent poser, sir, and I would do my level best to come uh, uh, come up to the expectations. The idea is that, uh, you know, sir, because of the fissiparious uh, tendencies. We lost your voice, sir. Uh, yes, including US, Europe, no, Russia, and India. So there has to be some kind of a uh, backup. The government of the day, especially if we talk about the New Delhi denomination, they are looking for a backup. They are lo looking for a support system wherein the civil society, including the the word media as I use it, which includes radio, tel radio, social media, television channels newspapers, so the media, which includes cinema also, they should take up a positive trail of thoughts. And they were expected or they are expected to convey the meaning or the girth or the pithiness behind a nation's foreign policy. New Delhi being an example, because we are from India. I was born in India and I'm particularly pretty much attracted towards the United States of America, that lore and myth and the legend 
so there is a conjointness which we, which we were trying to achieve apart from this coming back to your question humble question uh, very good question sir foreign policy also needs a bit of marketing if i use a crash term foreign policy needs a bit of propaganda taken in the positive sense of the term wherein the people of the country they should be aware of what the government is doing for them and some of the words like moral courage bravado or you know the determination and patriotism and the nationalistic ethos of the armed forces along with the dilettante and 24 by uh, six, uh, 24 hour approach followed by our diplomats they are not properly relate to the people because of a certain kind of an elitism and also because of the lack of exposure that the denizens of a country have about their prime minister about the external affairs ministry so you know some kind of a positivity a positive environment a kind of a uh, what do you call uh, a gungho and a kind of a positive ecosystem has to be built both nationally locally and globally so that the country can market itself it can present a very positive effectual effective and a very meaningful image for itself all across the world which is something which the present new delhi denomination has been doing and cinema can play a great role in this when we talk about wars when diplomacy fails when the negotiations fall flat on their face then it is the it is war time for countries and no country would want to uh, go into a war at this crucial juncture keeping in view the kind of rubble that the city of kiev has been shown to be in and the kind of maiming and massacring from both the sides are which is going on in the israel and the hamas conflict but the people the, for example coming back to india people are more concerned or more aware and sensitized about uh, their political leaders about the problems facing faced by new delhi in hygiene or let's say in good governance the way the schemes have been so imaginatively implemented by the uh, Modian denomination in New Delhi. So they are aware of it on a day-to-day, 24-hourly -day, basis, on a 365 days to, uh, hourly basis through the media, including all other segments of media. But when it comes to foreign policy, earlier on, diplomacy used to be carried on behind hidden doors. There used to be a clandestine element attached to foreign policy making, decision making and diplomacy. But since the coming in of 1991, that is the, and even the Vietnam War to a certain extent, there is a term which we can utilize very deftly, sir, that is immediacy. There is an immediateness. There is an immediacy in the war portrayal or in the foreign policy decision making portrayals, which came to the fore in the 70s, 60s and 90s. And you know, it is this kind of a philanthropic role, or let's say a socially utilizable conduit or a, a crucible, which the cinema happened to be that it was able to uh, propagate the interest or the national interest of the country, which is also being done by both Hollywood and Bollywood. By Hollywood is a kind of a planning, planned exercise since World War One, Two, and the Cold War years, and by it has become more prominent in India since 2014, where the mainstream Indian cinematic narrative talks about these values, these moral principles, which might seem too hallowed or too idealistic to some of us, but that is how, if they get conveyed in the right meaning, that can really help in national growth, progression, and integration. So that but would be my really, comment uh, on this. Sir. Coming to a very specific point, uh, despite Indian cinema, and especially Bollywood, glorifying a composite culture of Bharat, has cinema overall, or Bollywood in particular, really made an impact on bilateral relationship with our next door neighbor, Pakistan, in any substantial manner, in improving the relationship? Sir, I cannot hear you properly, sir. The question is that despite Indian cinema and Bollywood in particular, 
glorifying the composite culture of Bharat, has this made in any way any substantial impact on bilateral relationship with Pakistan? The efforts that is both. true, sir. So I have gathered the import of your question. I would personally feel that uh, there is, I am a nationalist Indian, I very much love my country, but you know, some of the observers have gone on to contend that uh, patriotism is, uh, is everybody's piece of cake. Uh, but you know, some sort of a zingoism, some sort of a zingoism, some kind of an uh, extremist thought pattern also germinates amongst the people. It also germinates among the people, wherein people tend to, or the citizens of a country tend to talk in terms of uh, the notion of us versus them, us versus them, wherein we can very, uh, very easily contend. We can easily comment and, uh, and think about it. That, for example, I would like to take names here. The Indian better lawyers have been the Pakistan, Pakistani state, we are not talking about the people, sir. Uh, the Chinese, they have fought wars against India. And you know, the 62 wars shadow she, uh, still lingers on to the Indian uh, state, statal establishment and also the defense establishment. Very much like the Vietnam War and the Vietnam War syndrome, which was very cannily crafted and it was disseminated to the global audiences bringing about the realities and the vagaries of war. And in the same manner, India too suffered a humiliating defeat in 62, the dark shadow of the war, as we call it, the China war syndrome akin to America. But we had a partial and a good victory in 65 and a complete victory in 1971 and good military objectives were achieved in 1999 through the Kargil war. And then came the Uri, uh, Uri Pathan court and the Balakot time between 2016 and 19. So I would personally feel that uh, people, the uh, people of the country, the citizens of the country need to be mainstreamed. They needed to be mainstreamed. And a kind of an awareness of the sacrifices made by our political leadership or the astute decision making and charisma of our political leadership along with the martyrdom of soldiers and officers who fought for the unity, integrity, and the safety of their fellow denizens. That too gets a Philip, as far as the cinematic portrayals are concerned. Though still I would say that foreign policy is not very much uh, impactful, impacted by cinema as such, but surely a, a positive frame of mind is something a civil societal ecosphere which thinks positively about their country and their defense apparatus and thinks negatively about separatism and insurgency, that really plays a role. And that role has been very nicely egged out and portrayed and depicted in the recent, uh, in the past decade or so, as far as Bollywood is concerned. That would be my response, sir. So war cinema, what you are saying has generally promoted the sense of patriotism and sense of nationalism, but the symbolism of war, at least in Indian context, has not gone to the next step further in terms of impacting on international relations or foreign policy as yet. It's just changing the national discourse and national feelings of patriotism. I personally feel that uh, the term, I have no ideologue, sir. I would humbly like to, to uh, assert and reiterate here, but still for, for uh, the betterment of, for the benefit of the organization and the audience. The idea is that, you know, the mainstreaming, once again, I'm reiterating and repeating my argument that mainstreaming and thinking positively about the country and being aware of the centripetal tendencies that run amok amongst the people that needs to be a uh, cub. And you know, one of the elements which I have uh, referred to, especially in my book, I have talked about Zero Dark Thirty, which was a movie made by Kathleen Biglow a few years back uh, in 2012 or 13. 
if i remember the year correctly wherein the uh, the caesar of the mansion in which uh, uh, osama bin laden was staying in abbottabad surprisingly very close to the to a pakistani cantonment so that kind of an imagery that kind of a backgrounder was attached to uh, zero dark 30 and you know this lady uh, as she has been portrayed by the director katherine biglow she does all the investigative exercises she faces a lot of systemic difficulties she is a she is a newcomer in the af park region though she is ably and very materially supported by the american security and spy espionage agencies so that kind of a thing is there and she does it very nicely so you know if you look into such portrayals what we can find out is that keeping a country's sanity intact keeping a, a country's uh, nationalistic and country loving instincts in, in, uh, instincts intact as far as the citizens are concerned that role can be beautifully played by the media television channels cinema and because we are talking about cinema uh, i would like to say that movies such as padmavat which i have mentioned in my book movies such as thana ji and gadar both the gadar that i have mentioned is word very comically and in a lighter vein gadar part 1 and gadar 2 they have talked about the one offense of the indian nation now it might be it might seem like a very elitist and uh, what do you call a very uh, a, a very stiff upper lip approach if adopted by the indians for the rest of the world but still thinking about the country and being prepared to make sacrifices for the countries but if that is not possible uh, we can just go in and commemorate our war heroes the unsung war heroes who laid down their lives and who did not care about their families and they placed the country above their family placed the country above their god and they fought for the integrity and uh, the unity and the security of the country so i would just like to uh, briefly mention here in my book also international relations needs a standard operating procedure needs a standard environment or a kind of an ecosystem where the governments can work comfortably and with the immediacy of the media to uh, to being brought in in the entire narrative or the discourse one can come up to a conjoined effort by the entire country where the citizens are participating in a positive manner and the government is at a come conveniently positioned for place to explain that why are they doing it that why india went into uri or uh, why uh, why sam bahadur as a movie is clicking with the indians which talks about 1971 war so that okay. way i think sir cinema can play a very positive effective and a very measured and meaningful role as far as international relations are concerned dr dubey you made your point very well let me come to a different aspect hollywood is an instrument of not only us government's foreign policy objective but it's part of their trade policies also in all the bilateral and multilateral trade agreements united states governments actually forces other parties for free access without any tariff to export of hollywood products to other countries uh do you have any comments on that on the mercantile aspect of the cinema uh, very true sir a very nicely enumerated uh, sir because uh, we talk about a moral morality we talk about ethics we talk about values and we talk about the higher pedestal of uh, nationhood or nationalism and patriotism these are not heavy words they have become very household names in india in the last 10 15 20 odd years and people have become aware of their roles and the duties as citizens of the nation or citizens of the country but a mercantile uh, part is definitely very definitively a part and parcel of the entire production exercise and uh, if i am not wrong if i go back into the helicon days of the american nation 50s in the 50s president dwight uh, eisenhower he went in there and he invented a, a a term called as mic 
that is the military industrial complex he talked about it and he actually though he was the president of the most powerful nation state on the face of the earth as we lovingly call america to be in our lectures and articles and uh, and the, and the narratives which we keep on advancing at iip and delhi so he went in and talked about a, a very crude reality that m stands for media or military also industry i and c is the country <coughs> c is the complex a corporate world and c is the corporate world so there happens to be a very inalienable uh, what do you call a, an ad mixture or a kind of a conjointness between the the uh, the corporate world the media houses and also the government of the day and the industry and i personally feel at my uh, own volition that uh, it is an inescapable reality wherein money and the capital needs to play a role and has playing a role has been playing a role uh, has been has been playing a role uh, as far as uh, what do you call uh, as far as uh, the impact uh, of the media on foreign policy is concerned that would be my comment sir so quoting from your own book us share of movie revenue was 70% in 2017 which is much higher than us share of gdp which is 20% of the world gdp and also much higher than us military expenditure as proportion of the world which is 28% Uh, so 70% revenue generated by american movies although they are GDP... by atom bomb sir pardon sir i am not able to uh, i am not able to listen to your question sir i i fail to understand it sir okay. US, some audio problem is there the us share of the movie revenue was 70% of the total world movie revenue in 9 in 2017 which is much higher than the us share of gdp which is 20% and us share of world's you know military budget or military expenditure which is 28% of the world gdp uh do you have comparable figures for india you know what proportion of world movie revenue is accounted for by bollywood specifically and maybe indian cinema at large i mean 70% of world movie revenue garnered by united states shows their mercantile policies are working very well using not only hollywood as a you know soft power issue but also they are making money out of hollywood very true so Sir, i have... think i would once again like to reiterate here that we cannot escape the uh, military industrial uh, and the corporate complex and uh, though being a, a idealist some of us are idealists in india here in new delhi and other places in delhi so we would like to say that uh, money has to play a role the market forces tend to dominate somewhere and uh, there have been very well known uh, scholars such as marshall mcluhan uh and uh, ben bagdikian uh, who wrote, who wrote a very seminal book on seminal book termed as media big media the media monolith or the title if i am not getting it correctly right now so both these scholars went on to give a lot of statistics a lot of data about how the cinematic uh, exercise started in us they actually if you go back to the american scenario especially in the 19 uh, in the 1898 then the spanish american war occurred sir the spanish american war occurred and william randolph first randolph first was the person who was covering it and whose newspapers and war correspond correspondents were employed over there at that point of time and he gave a very clear cut message to the uh, uh, to the newspaper uh, to the media and also to the citizens of america and to the war correspondents to be more precise that you give me the picture you give me the copy and i'll give you the war so i would just completely like to support you here it's a very pertinent uh, observation that money capital and the greenbacks they play a very keen role 
and in fact they are definitively a uh, they are definitively a mechanism uh, through which cinema is produced th through which the simulcra and the make believe effort comes to before the audiences so commerce is a is a medium which has always been there in currency as far as cinema productions in the realm of international relations and foreign policy is concerned that would be my take on it sir hollywood is definitely the soft power projecting the soft power of united states there's no ifs and buts about it the state department mandarin say that yes that is the purpose of hollywood and they are unabashedly taking credit for that but in terms of bollywood and bharat bollywood has been criticized as corrupting indian masses spreading cultural mores that are anti antithetical to bharatiya culture or indian culture so there seems to be a divide between the us situation versus indian situation indian context you have any comments on this definitely sir thanks for asking this pertinent poser as i call it i personally feel that bollywood has been influenced by the hollywood lately in fact not even lately i would like to correct myself here since the inception of uh, bollywood in india we have been some of us not all all the people not all the producers directors and the think tanks behind successful melodramas uh, in india they all have not been copying but hollywood has been a major signpost it has been a benchmark when we talk about the vietnam war years the flower children movement people copied uh, cinema stars in india of the order of shammi kapoor and others they copied the music the dance forms and the trend the beach the hair styling and also the dressage and it became very popular amongst the people and uh, you know then manoj kumar came out with his own pithy uh, own brand own genre of movies where in upkar kranti did a lot of good business and they endeared themselves to the indian and the global masses i definitely agree that some of the pockets most of the pockets of the india's population are not pre prepared for this cultural shock or for this cultural uh, what do you call uh, a repost a or a bamboozling of the young minds and adolescent minds by uh, uh by wild instincts from from the west i'm not talking about america because the kind of modernization and the kind of advancement that the americans achieved or the west achieved we are still yet to achieve it as prime minister narendra modi talks about it we are living in an age wherein we are preparing to be a great power i'm not saying that we are living in a uh, in a situation or a scenario where india is already a super power but he talks about the amrit kal the uh, the golden period that is india aims to become a developed nation by 2047 which i personally feel might be more than an ele ele electoral rhetoric or palaver about getting the votes but still going by the developments which have happened in india sociologically anthropologically and societally india or bharat because most of us stay in the some of most of the country stays in the villages or because of the migration patterns coming to the fore because of coming up of special economic zones and satellite towns giving delhi's example we have our ghaziabad we have our noidas we have our gurugrams so you know people are coming from the in internal the domestic heartland of the country from the rural belt to the urban belt and they might be getting pressed down by the khichdi culture or you know the that amalgamative culture which is being doled out by uh, by hollywood or let's say being aped by bollywood so that kind of a reticence should be part and parcel of the censor boards activities should be part and parcel of what the parents allow for their children to be watched because moral corruption always decays a society and india uh, harking back to the times of the sanatani dharma and the aryan and the harappan civilization or you know the vedic age we have taken pride in our 
uh, we have taken pride in our limited approach to life. That is our controlled and constrained approach to life and the idea of, uh, of containing oneself and uh, agreeing to what the God gives us and taking it with a smile. That has been the, uh, the central core element of the Indian civilization or the Indian civilization. And definitely the cultures which are doled out in movies like the flower children movement, the Vietnam war, the family troubles, you know, and the morals about uh, the moral scruples or presence of or the absence of them in the context of taking care of elderly people and going for a nuclear family and not looking into the theme of a joint family, which has been India's filial and familial strength. All these Indian practices, societal practices have been impacted definitively, I agree, by the kind of cinematic portrayals, or to if we larger our larger our ambit, if we uh, if we look into the other larges, then all the media, the music, the advertisements, the the jingles which come out, and the small uh, small vids which come out, they really create a problem. And a small kid, I'll give you a very brief example, who comes in from let's say from Rajasthan, from a town called Seeker or who comes from Jumri Talaiya, let's say, either from UP or Bihar, and he suddenly lands up in St. Stephen's doing English literature honors. Now he sees the Nirulas, he sees the Starbucks for the first time. He, neither does he have the mental setup, nor does he have the capital to have a, a pizza out there or to have a, a donut or something out there. He goes in there as part of the ragging exercise wearing a red colored jeans and drinks water and com comes out. So that kind of uh, antic is something which spoils his uh, devotion towards the main objective, which might have been getting a lectureship in Delhi University later on or becoming an IAS officer, which, so you know, that kind of a cultural shock is something which is further emboldened which for, further weakens the intent and determination of that young kid who comes, let's say, from UP, Bihar or Rajasthan or any other part of the country from southern India who's seeing this madcap uh, exercise of, radicalize, uh, of uh, modernization, advancement and modernity in its crassest form, sir. So I agree with you there. Uh, coming to Bollywood again, Bollywood had a standard or a kind of production series called formula movies. You know, there was a formula, each movie was based on that kind of formula. Similarly, in Hollywood, at least in the Cold War era, there was a formula movie series, and that was the James Bond. So the formula was a lot of sex, glamour, fast action, moral superiority of West. Now that formula worked very well for Hollywood during the Cold War era. What do you think is relevance of that formula movie in post Cold War era? Because every time, so, uh, are we concentrating and zeroing in, uh, zeroing in upon uh, Cold War, sir? Yeah, Cold War, definitely, oh. sir. We are. Uh, I have not been very much into that Cold War Bollywood portrayals and depictions, because I was mostly mostly looking at and analyzing and going through literature on war movies, and you know movies about foreign policy, diplomacy and the big founding fathers of our political leadership. Yeah, still, I would like to look into it. I personally feel that the hashish and the ganja generation, the flower children movement, especially Devanand came out with a very interesting comment on the wayward youth, how he searches for his sister, uh, Zina Daman, if I get the name correct, how he searches for her and manages to find her amongst a group of drug addicts. And you know, that kind of psychedelia, it was there. The psychedelia was there in the 60s and 70s. 
and that was and very very rightly posited by you sir it was copied aimed verbatim and uh, as by the indian uh, movie makers and directors too and that came into ascendancy that became part of the popular culture and that became very popular but you know criticality like if you talk into the uh, talk about the genre of war movies apart from talking about the technological finesse and the higher upper moral ground of the american motives or the western motives they uh, the indians also went in there with a different kind of a take uh, in their in their movies and and in their understandings so i would personally feel that psychedelia or you know that kind of hashish generation played a role as far as uh, delimiting the understanding of the indian uh, audiences as far as that is concerned but the alternative media one can say it was very surreptitiously and it was very effectively hijacked by the alternate media in american universities and in the in the other sections of press wherein they became overtly highly critical of the american establishment and that is where the catch lied that a balance had to be reached wherein an over overdose of free sex violence and movies which have been made by quentin tarantino such as natural born killers which i have also mentioned in my book they all are replete with such excesses recently my book came out around 6 uh, around 4 months back a movie uh, titled as animal has been minting money at the box office and ranveer kapoor has has really made it a point with his uh, acting demeanor and acting enterprise but you know the kind of relationship that has been portrayed between the father and the son there is nothing wrong in it but the kind of instruments the kind of agencies which are utilized by the wronged son by the insecure son about his father they tend to be very violent it tends to be very vitriolic and something which has earned for the movie an a certificate so such uh, portrayals and depictions definitely have a negative impact upon the indian audiences and the young vulnerable and the gullible minds of the kids which they need some escorts for that to make a point but i personally coming back to your psychedelia psychedelia in fact ruled the roost in india also in the 60s and 70s and especially the big collared shirts the bell bottoms all that kind of modernization was very avidly copied by the indian filmmakers and i have nothing new new about my comment but i would say that that became the credo of the times let's say during my father's generation my maternal uncles they all fall fell for it that would be my observation sir so in the chapter on the genre of war movies and i'm going to quote very specific on page 1 or 2 you are citing navel maxwell on which one sir navel maxwell uh, ah navel maxwell navel maxwell uh, on his book india's china war you cite a conversation between nikita khrushchev and mao zedong uh, nikita khrushchev says why did you have to kill people on your border with india quote and quote and mao replies they attacked us first crossed the border and continued firing for 12 hours coat and coat and nikita khrushchev retorts coat and coat nobody was killed among chinese only among the indians and this is a conversation supposedly between nikita khrushchev and mao as recorded by navel maxwell and you cite that in your book which tries to portray a much benign soviet attitude towards india during the 1962 war but it's also a reality that soviet stole india in 1962 war that you are our friends chinese are our brothers they are communists 
And in fact, India was forced to seek help from United States and not Soviet Union in the 1962 war. So this portrayal of the conversation between Nikita Khrushchev and Mao, do you buy it? Did it actually happen? What is next, uh, Naval Maxwell writing? I would just like to, I won't comment on this particular snippet of conversation, which occurred between Mao Zedong and uh, Nikita Khrushchev. As far as the author, uh, authenticity is concerned, things are there and uh, conspiratorially people might comment upon it. But I personally feel that one of the, I would like to relate it to the difficulties that an academic personage faces in India. Because when we talk about the wars, our victories and defeats, our glorious victories and our humiliating defeats, which was 1962 because of the political unimaginativeness or let's say wrong planning or want of proper equipment and clothing for the soldiers. All these issues have been raised multiple times and they have received multiple responses. But I personally would feel here that as it was the, uh, as it was the Cold War era and you know, when we talk about, when, when you have mentioned about it, sir, that uh, uh, that uh, that at that particular point of time, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru wrote a letter to John F. Kennedy, and he said that the the Chinese are invading us with all their might, and the Northeast Frontier uh, Agency (NEPA) and in uh, at other places, Chushul had occurred, Bombdela had fallen, and uh, uh, Nehru ji gave a speech wherein he said that we are doing our best to let the Chinese marauders stay where they are. But he realized the situation. Krishna Manon did not to a great extent. And B.N. Malik also did not uh, prove himself well uh, to be a good army general at that particular point of time. But these are uh, uh, these are some aspects which we can look into. And as far as the entire idea is concerned, it was President John F. Kennedy who wrote back to Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru. And this is a lesser realized uh, factual development. Uh, in academia in India, I don't know about United States of America, but in India at least, he promised a few squadrons of star fighters, fighter jets, to India uh, at the request of, President, of Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru. And apart from that, he also said that America was, was willing to protect the cosmopolitan centers, the metropoles of India, where in certain state-of-the-art uh, radars can be given to India at that point of time. So, you know, people have been talking about the misunderstandings and the misapprehensions and the confusions that pervaded the India-US relationship at this particular point of instant. And initially, it did not go well between Nehru and Eisenhower. It did not go well between Nehru and other prime ministers. But this particular inst uh, instance, is a poignant reminder that Americans offered first to India. I have been mentioning it repeatedly in my papers, in my discussions with senior bureaucrats and army officers at IIPA. That is why it was America, which first came that came to the door of New Delhi during Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru's uh, reign, his uh, his tenure, and they offered India to become a member of. Certain strategic groupings, such as, such as NATO, Seattle, and Cento. And Pakistan has always remained, always remained a secondary choice for them. But India, at that particular point of time, was talking about third world leadership. We were sort of having a very high moral purge for ourselves, which was also not wrong to a great extent, because neutrality, non-alignment was something which was a kind of a safe route for India's diplomacy and India's foreign policy at that particular point of time. So we said a big no. We rejected the American offer. And what I do not understand, somebody can explain to me that India crept onto the American disinterest. The UNSC vetoing and voting patterns of America as far as the Israel conflict is concerned and as far as the Kashmir question is concerned. They keep on talking about it. They keep on re repeating it. But I personally feel that though India was not ready for any kind of an 
equal shoulder to shoulder allow allyhood with the west or maybe with the united states of america sir but uh, if we could have said a yes to them maybe that kind of a disdain disinterest and sort of a bellicosity which entered the domain of india us partnership that could could have, could have been lessened to a great extent so that would be my comment on it sir hollywood as you have acknowledged rightly you know projected soft power of us uh, patriotism in us on the other hand bollywood has been criticized for taking anti national postures at times and i'll give you a very concrete example there was time when general musharraf was the pakistani dictator and president a delegation of bollywood personalities led by mahesh bhat went for an interview in islamabad to meet musharraf and in that meeting musharraf demanded that bollywood give preferential treatment to pakistani actors and not black uh, you know blacklist them uh, and also soften the image of pakistan in bollywood movies do you have any comments on patriotic credentials of bollywood yes sir, definitely it's a very important event which occurred we pretty being pretty young in the age we also followed it uh we uh, we also followed it uh, we watched it on daily doordarshan news and everything i st- i still remember the the fundamentals and the brass tacks of it i would just like to say that as far as pakistan is concerned uh their artists have always been they have been welcomed in india they have been welcomed in india there was a singer during my times hasan jahangir hasan jahangir who the pop uh, heartthrob in pakistan and his song hawa chali hai teri gali se pooch liya hai maine kali se now it it is not something which is alternative in alternate in concern or in nature but that became a very popular sing, a single a popular ditty as far as india and the young people in india is concerned then there have been exchanges of folk music you know but we should not forget that in the name of civil society exchanges and in the name of diplomatic exchanges something which i mentioned in my book also this movie talks a great deal about this particular aspect only that is sarfaroz starring amir khan and it's a very intelligent movie and a highly it, it's a big commercial success too this talks about the character of nasiruddin shah who is a, a very well known uh, folk artist a ghazal gayak as he's a singer to be more precise and he has great terms and relations both with the pakistani diplomats and also with the indian diplomats in new delhi is a popular entity a popular presence in the parties and the merry making exercises that go on in new delhi and it is amir khan who investigates who is investigating the case of cache of weaponry which is being given to terrorists in mumbai and in through jaisalmer to a town in jaisalmer and you know that kind of a lovey dovey aspect of an india pakistan relationship is very well uh, very well exemplified by nasiruddin shah but as it turns out i mentioned in my book also this narrative changes completely when the young ramjes college pass out and the young ips officer that these happen to be our icons and not other people they become part and parcel of the entire thing they realize that nasiruddin shah is a criminal and he is a conduit for weapons uh, 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 weapons what do you call uh, export in india and he spreads it to the terror mongers and other criminals in the nation so you know sir i would say uh, i might be lampooned as a hardliner but until and unless the pakistan whether it be parvez musharraf imran khan sardari or bilawal whoever comes to power now nawaz sharif has come back but as far as if you look into this media uh, this cinematic portrayal also as long as they are aiding and abetting terrorism in india as long as uh, our army is bleeding blue because of their terror and separatist acts their jihadi proclivities india should refrain as a citizen as a citizen of the country 
and as a young academic i would like to request the establishment i have been doing it before my ias officers and my brigadiers at iip also ki we should not have much of an interaction with pakistan so pakistan happens to be a failing state because of the economic uh, recession because of the floods and the visits of antonio guterres and the statements of joe biden and imf heads all fall to are all pinpoint towards a similar direction but so, i personally as a citizen of my country uh, would not prefer india to have much much of a diplomatic interaction or or to have any interaction or any transactional could could, could procure with pakistan unless and until they eschew the terror activities cross border so, terrorism the, should be off the leaf of the india pak talks only about, then we can talk this is something sir humbly asserting i have been following it and i have been preaching it and pontificating about it since you long may, you that may should be my response let me get to the next point talking about anti national postures of bollywood personalities you mentioned about amir khan and sir farosh movie but i am going to ask you a different question amir khan went to turkey and met the wife of president erdogan if you look at international relations turkey has taken consistently anti india posture in all the international fora in conjunction with pakistan what was the purpose of amir khan going to turkey and meeting the wife of erdogan what is he trying to do there definitely sir i get the purport of your question i would like to reiterate very pithily very tersely here sir that you know i have already mentioned that the civil societal exchanges between the indian fraternity and the pakistani fraternity is not going to lead to anything to something which is fruitful or fulsome for the for the upkeep of peace and stability in south asia i personally feel that pakistan happens to be a fly in the ointment as far as the peace car or the peace drive is concerned in the entire south asia especially the all weather friend uh, phenomenology which has been uh, created by china for pakistan that also happens to be a bug bear for india and it's a irritant in the entire state of stability pelf and stability in south asia i agree with you here completely that amir khan should not have visited that that personage and he should have been more loyal to india but you know sir uh, it is once again we go back to the daud ibrahim days the way the manner in which the d factor used to be dominant in mumbai and the west asian countries where indian stars though nobody has pointed them indian stars like anil kapoor govinda mithun chakravarti they used to take part sit next to daud ibrahim get themselves photographed in the india pakistan cricket matches and they used to go for uh, parties they used to perform they used to earn uh, unlimited kitties of moola from the west asian magnates and oil magnates and i would not desist from saying here that is the d company so that kind of a that kind of a uh, overture on the part of the bollywood stars was never welcomed in india was never welcomed by the sane and aware citizenry in india we criticized it we criticized it as free willing citizens and later on we continue to do so in a, from our podiums and rostrums wherever we speak about it i personally feel that the when you clapping when a person claps only one palm is not enough the pakistani palm is non existent since the beginning the indian prime minister in may 2014 uh, invited all the heads of states coming back to the realm of international relations and all the south asian heads of states were invited at his inaugural function and later on india uh, jay shankar saab oh, he also went in and uh, issued a request to the pakistanis when they when they took away the mfn status from india in 16 and 17 and uh, several such 
provocative acts were indulged in by Pakistan. So, you know, instead of India blaming Pakistan, it is the Pakistani head of state who have repeatedly been blaming India, that is New Delhi. That is New Delhi. Wherein they have gone on to contend that India does not respond to peace overtures. That is not the right approach. We have always been doing it. The Indian Prime Minister on his trip all the way from Moscow during the initial uh, uh, part of his uh, Modi 1.0. I am no, no votary, sir, for any political party, but I am speaking from heart. So the idea that happens to be here is that he dropped anchor uh, in the granddaughter's marriage of Nawaz Sharif. And still, immediately after that, there were certain incidents of terrorism in India. Whenever talks are being held, <coughs> whenever talks are being held between New Delhi and Islamabad, some sort of a, a, a disturbance or some sort of a hostile act does occur uh, at the borders, at the LOC between India and Pakistan, or there is definitely sometimes a ceasefire violation, which we can, the government has been petting about it a few days uh, back, petting itself. Then a few days back, the Jammu Kashmir Reorganization Amendment Act was tabled in the parliament by Sri Amit Shah. And they said that the ceasefire violations have been only two since the last, since the time the Article 370 was abrogated in Kashmir. There have been not a single incident of stone pelting. Uh, in the state, and things have been very stable and peaceful comparatively, I am saying. Comparatively, so we are not being votary, political votaries, but I would just like to culminate with this comment that uh, societal exchanges can only occur when Pakistan and its deep state are willing to have a true, blue, honest dialogue with, with India, which they have been negating it with, they are not sidestepping away with the POK issue, they are not sidestepping away from the terror sponsoring part of it. That would be my humble take, sir. So we are running short of time. We are already over the time. So I'll conclude this conversation with a comment. After going through your book, uh, my own observation is that the more appropriate title for this book should be Cinema, Soft Power and International Relations rather than very true, sir, very international true. relations, because that's the intermediate step, which is leading to fruitful action, at least in case of West. Cinema as a tool of soft power, leading to international relations and foreign policy objectives. The situation in Bharat is not there yet. We have not used the soft power to further our foreign policy objectives, because situation of Hollywood versus Bollywood are totally different. And with those comments, I thank you, Dr. Manan Vivedi, to take this challenging subject in an academic manner, because I have not seen anyone in India taking this in an academic manner. So I would believe that this is a noble attempt to study international relations, the role of cinema, the role of soft power, and possibly role of cultural diplomacy. Definitely, yeah. sir. I would. I'm heart, heart, uh, heartfully uh, thankful uh, to CSA and sir to you, Dr. Aditya Ji, and your think tanks, entire team, and the WhatsApp group which we are, uh, which we are attached to. We keep on getting very valuable, timely, and uh, important and uh, useful utilitarian is the word I would use, information, which forms a very interesting study mat for us, that is professors and lecturers who can glean some something out of it. I would personally end on this note that soft power happens to be the order of the day, uh, wherein soft power has been utilized deftly by India. And I personally feel, I might be wrong into saying this, but that this is what I feel, that the New Delhi dispensation has very aptly utilized the idea of public diplomacy, which has, which is completely covers the ambit of soft power. So that way, if we can win the hearts and minds of our enemy country's population, that is what America has been trying through its virtual embassy in Iran also. That can, why not, why cannot India try 
or why cannot we we try it with our adversaries or with our friends alike so thanks a lot sir once again for inviting me and making me part of this uh, exercise this academic exercise sir thank you sir thank you very much indeed and we hope that you will grace our platform in future as well to our viewers this was a conversation with dr manand devedi assistant professor at indian institute of public administration on his recent book cinema and international relations and we take your permission to end this interview namaste thank you sir namaskar sir namaskar sir